университет ставит перед собой две задачи. The university sets itself two tasks. For you, first of all, to succeed as specialists, this is one of the most important components in general, and your fate in particular, your well-being. This is prosperous work. But there is an equally important task. This is the task of maturing to the level of human, a human with a capital letter, a reasoning human, and to provide oneself with a strong, reliable support element, this is a family. To create a family, a good, reliable one, this is also a very difficult task. And in fact, my speech today is primarily related to the second problem, to help you mature to the level of human, to help you make sure that you have a happy family, that you have strong, healthy children that cause you joy, because creating a family in general for you is not far off. Now you must clearly understand how to do it correctly in order to be happy, both at work and at home. You know the old aphorism, happy is the person who hurries home with joy after work and in the morning rushes to work with the same dobrious mood. My lecture will, among other things, contribute to your understanding of how it is possible to avoid bad accidents in life. You know, life is arranged in such a way that one person has some accidents, the other has different ones, but all this is not accidental. It all depends on the person himself. I will also try to tell you this today. I wanted to start by talking to you about such everyday, ordinary rules, but, well, it feels like you have such an aura which is slightly different. Yesterday I gave a lecture for managers, lawyers and economists, and I even had to make reprimands. They were distracting with their conversations. I feel that in this audience this will not be necessary. I would really like you to understand that in life it is very important to learn how to speak, converse and listen. These are three completely different states. Today I am talking, you are listening. Well, there is another, third state. This is the ability to converse, the ability to hear the interlocutor. Conversation is always the interaction of two parties. So learning to listen is also very important. And I have this advice for you. You will spend at least the next four years in classrooms with teachers. You should know that information comes in many respects not only through the ears, through words, through vocabulary, but also through the eyes. Therefore try to always look carefully into the eyes of the teacher, because there is such a non-verbal system of information transfer. And if it happens that through the words I was not quite able to grasp something, nevertheless through the eyes the information passed, and sooner or later this information emerges. Therefore, attention in the classroom is very important. And I would like to also address you with an appeal and a request on the matter of class attendance. Today you have one job. This is to study. And therefore you must immediately develop human qualities in yourself. If you engage in something, then you need to do so responsibly, and this will ensure you a good fate later. Therefore, I always tell my students, if, for example, Throughout the semester you attended every class without fail, then I am your supporter, I am on your side. And if in some subject you have a bad grade, then I myself am ready to intervene and figure out why this happened. Because most likely this is already a question of the teacher. After all, the student was always present, was in the classroom, but could not pass the exam. I believe that in this case the question is not only about the student, but also about the method of teaching. Therefore, you should know that if you attend classes, then I am your protector and guarantor that everything will be fine with you. And if you don't go to classes, it will be difficult to find support here in the administration. You know that the eyes are the mirrors of the soul, which is why I say to you that you need not only to listen, but also to perceive information through the eyes. I, among other things, tell you that for the future, when you are leaders, you should know that a person can lie with words, but he cannot lie with his eyes. 
If you develop this quality in yourself, it will be easier for you in life. Let's say you are hiring a person, you need to understand what kind of person they are, he is narrating to you about how good he is, but you are looking carefully into his eyes. And you can develop this skill in yourself to such an extent that you will absolutely and clearly understand much of what is not said in words. The topic of our lecture is fundamentals of worldview security. What kind of security are we talking about? And in general, what would I like to tell you? What is this all for? To put it bluntly and succinctly, I want you to understand that you need to learn, first of all, from nature and not from TV. The fact is that in the conditions of globalization we are talking about, today such a unified corporation has been created, if you like, the entire globe. Look at the mass media in any country in the world. They are one and the same. Those programs, those channels of ours, those entertainment shows of different roles, they are one and the same in all countries of the world. And our media, unfortunately, do not invent anything new. And I want you to understand that the aim of media today is to realize the interests of the transnational corporations. That is, you will never see anything on TV that would contribute to your spiritual growth, to your becoming a human with a capital letter and so on. There are purposefully worked out schemes of how to make a person focused on all sorts of vices, since money is made on human vices. And so, the formation of vices in you, this is the main task of mass media. Today no one especially hides it. I had one slide which I showed yesterday. So there they talked about a conversation between one of our scientists and an American scientist. They say, our task is to make it that the people are as poorly educated as possible, as poorly cultured as possible, and consume as much as possible. That is, we need to grow a consumer without a sense of measure and one who does not understand what is happening in order that we earn money on him because the transnational corporations need to sell and need everyone to buy. This is the main task. It is achieved by the so-called egregorial matrix governance. After all, no one forces you to smoke, no one impels you to do so. How is this achieved? This is achieved by egregorial matrix methods. That is, a kind of informational space is formed in which you find yourself. A person is born in the light of God. He is essentially a blank piece of paper. And then how does this happen, suppose, in a printing house? Then this sheet is launched into the printing equipment and there is a certain matrix, a slap, and everything that is inscribed into this matrix ends up imprinted on the sheet. It is the same with a person. He appears, is a blank sheet of paper, and then through life he forms in himself a world view. What is a world view? A world view is representations of the world in images and pictures. It is formed mainly through the eyes. A person looks around and his ideas about life are formed. And what does he see when he looks around? What does he see on TV? I responsibly declare to you that you will not find a single film where there are no scenes of drunkenness, where there are no scenes with smoking. We have researched the entire history of cinema, starting with the first films. In the entire history of cinematography, not a single film has been shot without this. Can you imagine? Do you believe it just happened like that? What, everyone smokes right from the morning to night? Prosecutors, bandits and investigators? Take a look at our films. No, this is all not simple and not accidental. It was done precisely for you, so that you perceive it through your eyes as a norm. In psychology, there is such a concept, imprinting. Imprinting is the impressing of a certain image that remains with you in your consciousness. In this case, in the mind, first of all, there remains not what is told to you, but what you see. You can talk as much as you like about the dangers of alcohol and cigarettes, 
But if dad and mom drink beer and wine in the evening, then all the same, the person will consider this the norm, even without knowing why. You, most likely, will take it all as harmless. I have spoken with very intelligent people on this topic, and one of them, for example, said, What are you on about? I started smoking by myself. No one influenced me in this way. This is an example of a complete lack of understanding of technology. Because before independently making a decision, a person through his eyes has perceived scenes of smoking hundreds and thousands of times. So a world view was formed in him where a person perceives this to be the norm. Therefore, the main goal of our meeting today is to secure you from those influences that are daily, hourly exerted on you with the help of all currently existing means in the era of globalization. This is TV, radio, newspapers, the internet and so on. Everything works only for the purpose of turning you into a mindless consumer of everything and everyone to ensure the earnings and profits of transnational corporations. I will remind you of one story from the life of Jesus Christ, which is not contained in the Bible, but is contained in the so-called Apocrypha. Christ had a dispute with an overseas merchant. Christ asked him why he had brought this overseas food here. He replied in surprise, saying that he strove, labored, so that the locals could enjoy it. Christ replied, saying, you did not grow it for health, you grew this food for money. And then Christ ends the dispute with the following phrase, every nation should feed on the fruits of its land. Unhappy is the land that does not feed its people. It should be learned that we derive our main health from our native land, and only the product that has grown on our land is beneficial to us, and the water that flows from our sources is beneficial. And here we have, by the way, the Alexander Garden, not far from here, a wonderful spring. I always take my canister for water with me when I go for a run. Try to drink fresh spring water, then you will feel your native nature and health. By the way, in the USA, about 60 to 70 percent of the absolutely physiologically sick population are overweight. And two teams work well. One team works to make people fat, and fat is sugar first of all. By the way, I have no sugar at home, this is not a food product. If refined sugar had been invented today, no one would have allowed it to be consumed. This is just a tradition with us today. Sugar completely destroys the metabolic process in the body, and it simply cannot be consumed. I don't use it. We simply have no sugar at home. I can eat a spoonful of honey or sweet fruits, but by no means sugar. Next is white flour. You know how it's done. First, the sprout is beaten off from each grain, that is, the most valuable part of the grain is removed. All that remains is white flour. Why is it removed? Because it is in the interests of transnational corporations. Because if you leave the sprout on the grain in the flour, then it will quickly deteriorate. And the grain carries fats, vitamins and so on, and they do not allow the flour to be stored for a long time. I was in Novosibirsk, where scientists showed me this process in detail. I don't remember everything now, but if my memory serves me, the E934 additive is a derivative of aspartic acid. They showed me chewing gum. Indeed, when you open it, you can often see the inscription sugar-free, that is, without sugar. But when you put the gum in your mouth, it's sweet. So, what's the secret? The fact is that there is a sweetener, E934, derived from aspartic acid. And aspartic acid is an agent of chemical warfare that is used to perform the lobotomy operation, separating the left and right hemispheres of the brain. I could talk about this for a long time with varying degrees of detail, but it is quite possible that this contributes to the desynchronization of the left and right hemispheres. The left hemisphere is responsible for abstract logical thinking and the right hemisphere for object imagery thinking. 
In humans, these two hemispheres must work synchronously. In a lobotomy, aspartic acid is used, and when it enters the body through chewing gum, it is never removed, it simply accumulates. And if a person constantly chews gum, then such a phenomenon develops in him where his eyes dart slightly in different directions. Such people's psyches in their informational analysis systems become dysfunctional. So there are such understandable and simple things, but nobody will ever cover them for you, anywhere. Why? Let me remind you of Pushkin. He said, Nor do I worry if the press is free to hoax the nitwits or if sense of pokers. That is, unfortunately, with regards to everything that is written, everything that is presented on television, the interests of transnational corporations are the first priority. Therefore, our task is to instill in you a sense of measure, to instill in you the quality of distinction, so that having watched or seen something, you may understand why it has been given to you, what they are trying to do, what problem they are trying to solve, whether directly or indirectly. Therefore, it is necessary to master the quality spoken of in the Quran. There is a particular chapter called the Al-Furqan. Al-Furqan is translated from Arabic as distinction. Distinction is a very important quality for a person. If you do not have this quality of distinction, then you can be played, as they say today, like suckers. And the tasks, in general, of the current situation are to ultimately transform our youth into plankton, which can be used to make money. So I want the students of our university to comprehend this, to puzzle it out and understand it, in order that they not find themselves in this trap. There are two circumstances according to which this information is given only at our university. Here we have published a course of lectures which, like today's lectures, is called the Foundations of Worldview Security in the Context of Globalization. There is such a book in the library. At the end of our lecture, I will name a list of references. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that nowhere at any university in St. Petersburg is such information given. And people come to us for this information in general from all over the world. This weekend, for example, there was a meeting with a delegation from Australia. On Friday, a team from Dagestan came to me. This is the leadership of the administration of the city of Kaspisk. Meetings are ongoing practically daily. This weekend, Minsk has asked me to come and give a lecture to their youth. Therefore, you, dear students, should know, and let the boys not be offended, that the worthy future of our country will only be ensured once the girls sitting in this hall give birth to, and give to us girls, of the qualities of Vasilisa the Wise and Helen the Beautiful, and that they themselves would develop these qualities, then our country will change. We talk a lot about how we can change, how to change this, how to change that, but first of all we need to change ourselves. You can't have a happy, previous, well-ordered country made up of villains, not so. That is, the most important thing is to change yourself. So I would really like you to understand this problem so that you understand that working on yourself is one of the most difficult jobs. So there are two circumstances according to which this course is given at our university. The first circumstance is that our university is located in the city of Pushkin, Tsarskaya Sila. This is the location of the most powerful egregor of the prophet of Russian civilization, Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin. Pushkin, in my understanding, is a prophet. I cannot dwell on this in detail, but at the level of the second semantic line, in all his works, he encoded global information about our existence, about man, about creation, and perhaps the 21st century will be the century where Pushkin's work will finally be pondered over deeply and re-evaluated. Something you can read in my book, which is in the library here, Course on the Age of Aquarius. 
There is a particular chapter which is called The Secret Codes of Pushkin. In one of my other books, there is a chapter about Pushkin called Pushkin as a Prophet of Russian Civilization. Therefore, the egregor of Pushkin is most strongly represented, if you will, in this hall, in the buildings of our university, since they're all located around the Pushkin Lyceum. And the second circumstance is that our university is one of the few universities that maintains a direct relationship with nature. All the other universities are technical. There are hundreds of universities in St. Petersburg, but universities that have something to do with nature can be counted on the fingers of one hand. But our university is unique for the entire Northwest. This is the only agrarian university in the Northwestern Federal District, and this circumstance obliges us to a lot. I will ask you to include the first slide in order to more actively include your vision in the perception of the material. Here, look at the position of Lomonosov. He says, Nature is, in a sense, the gospel, proclaiming loudly the creative power of the wisdom of God's greatness. And not only in heaven, but also the bowels of the earth, proclaim the glory of God. That is, I want to say to you that you are dealing with the gospel. Gospel from Greek means good news. And how to understand this good news from God? I'll tell you, I had a three-hour dispute with the academic secretary of the St. Petersburg Theological Academy on the topic of how to understand the providence of God. After all, it is most likely that God, at the time he conceived a person, also conceived some sort of mission for the person, and he expects something from us. But what is it that he expects from us? How to understand this? What should a human be? How to understand the channel of the providence of God in which a person should act? So he began to argue that such things can only be cognized through the Holy Scriptures. But I am very familiar with the Scriptures. I've been engaged with theology for 25 years, more or less by heart. I know the most important passages of the Bible, the Quran and Buddhism. I quoted him the Bible and the Quran on basic social issues, on issues of being. These contain directly opposite positions. That is, if, say, the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy teaches the lending of money at interest in order for you to govern over those who borrow from you at interest, then the Quran says that to lend money at interest is the most terrible sin. There is no more terrible sin than when you lend someone 100 rubles and ask for 101 rubles in return, because this means that you stole one ruble. This is a question of nerviousness, not of economics. The Quran interprets this question in precisely this way. Further, the Quran, for example, prohibits the consumption of alcohol, tobacco, prohibits gambling, while in the Bible they talk about how Christ ate a lot there at some feast and how he drank wine, that he turned water into wine, and so on and so forth. That is, directly opposite approaches. And my interlocutor asked me, what is your own opinion on the matter? I told him that, in my opinion, the only authentic, that is, accurate without distortion, epistle of God is nature. You see, nature is the product of God's labor. Now, if you want to understand some artist, his way of thinking, his world view, his views on everything that happens, then study his paintings. So, in the same way, you study what happens in nature, and if you study what is in nature, this is, if you will, cognition of the Creator's design. In other words, then you can come to understand what it was that God wanted in creating nature, its laws, and so on. And if on television you only learn how to feed transnational corporations, then in nature you can catch a glimpse of some completely different themes. For example, take a closer look. We have zoo engineers here in the hall. Here you take a closer look at nature. Here at the spring, for a rather short period of time, 
The nightingales are filled with song, so to speak, until they drop. You will definitely have heard this. The songs of nightingales are simply an amazing musical phenomenon. Have any of you wondered why nightingales sing, but over such a short span of time? The fact is that nightingales sing only when the female nightingale is incubating chicks and sitting in the nest. And why do nightingales sing during this period? They do this so that the chicks that emerge from the egg later have good voices, have a good musical schooling. So they have the same trills as their parents. That is, from generation to generation, they pass on these skills of completely unique and amazing singing. So if you want your family to be prosperous and happy, then you don't learn this from TV, but you learn this from nature. So the relationship should be exactly the same as that of the nightingales. Dad should sing good songs from morning to evening in the literal sense and figuratively, metaphorically that is, pronounce only good words, only dobrious words, radiate warmth, joy. Then the child will be healthy. If during the pregnancy, some scandals constantly occur, some squabbles, then it's guaranteed that the child will have psychological abnormalities. He will sleep poorly, he will eat poorly, he will have some other problems. Here on our website, in the section Literature, you can find a little book called Education in the Womb of the Mother. With their singing at the spring, nightingales are doing precisely this. They understand this. And I would like you and I to rise at least to the level of the animal world in general. Because if you follow the advice and the matrices that are launched on television, then you won't succeed in anything worthwhile in life. And now let's look at the technology of the Creator, the Programmer, God. Take a look. I'll give you some examples. Look at the Internet. In general, it is opposed to these transnational corporations because on it you can find a variety of information, including of a conceptually significant and meaningful nature. So, here are some examples. There is such an ant, Atta. Type in the search engine, Atta ant with two Ts. There you will find many pictures which go into a lot of detail. So, the queen of these ants, in comparison to the other ants, is much larger in size. These ants make these anthill cities with a diameter of up to 15 meters and a height of up to 6 meters. That is, structures much more powerful than cities for humans. And there you have tunnels, bridges, interchanges. Everything is thought out there from A to Z. The queen ant resides in a sealed chamber made of a concrete-like material that only a crowbar could break. Well, they carried out research where they damaged this chamber with special instruments, after which the queen suddenly disappeared. Although the passages are especially built so that the ants can drag food and accordingly remove the eggs that are laid by the queen. That is, it is physically impossible for her to leave her cell, since the dimensions of the passages and their openings these are ten times smaller than the queen herself. Nonetheless, she disappeared. They observed this several times. At first, they thought that the ants were eating her, but they were unable to figure it out. Then they put marks on the queen with special radioactive paints and continued their research. And to the great surprise of the researchers, the queen disappeared from one chamber but appeared in another which had been empty before, and which these ants had prepared in advance. What is this? This is a well-known phenomenon called teleportation. In science on this topic there are only guesses, hypotheses, as to whether it's possible at all. I had two meetings with Sai Baba, who has since passed away. Here is a very curious story. Sai Baba lived in India. You know he had a website? Maybe the site is still up and running. It was called bog.ru. Every morning, he would receive up to 7,000 fans from all over the world. And he would go out for 10 to 15 minutes, 
walking along the rows of people. And so, on the first day, he came up to me and took me to his place. And on the second day, the exact same thing. He came up to me and took me to his place. Everyone was shocked because an invitation by him is a rarity and there was no need to dream of a second invitation. This had never happened before in history. We spoke together on various issues, but there existed such theories saying he was able to materialize certain things from the vacuum. You know that the universe is arranged in such a way that there is a physical vacuum. As a physicist, I tell you that a vacuum is not a void. It is just a zero on average. But in general, part of matter exists in a materialized form and part exists in the form of a vacuum. So from this vacuum, it is possible to create matter. One need only to very clearly imagine what you plan to materialize. There is radiation of torsion fields and matter appears. Sai Baba possessed these technologies and in the same way, there is all manner of conjecture concerning him that he is capable of realizing this teleportation mechanism. But teleportation means that physically you need to copy some object, very clearly enter it into the information matrix, then instantly decompose it into atoms and molecules and reassemble it according to this matrix in a different place. That is, the transfer of a material object from one point to another without transporting it physically, this is teleportation. So, the queen of the Atta ants has such abilities. The warbler, a 20 gram bird, makes a non stop five day flight over the ocean and accurately arrives at the designated place without any compasses or weather reports. The basilisk lizard moves over the water like a hovercraft, blowing air under its paws, gliding over the surface. There are also relatives of wasps called ichneumonidae. They drill a tree with an ovipositor to a depth of more than 7 centimeters and fall into a lava previously found inside the tree. Just imagine, there is a lava inside the tree at a depth of 7 centimeters and they somehow lay their eggs in this lava. They somehow understand where this lava is and it's precisely at the depth of 7 centimeters. But you feel, understand, that our human consciousness is still very, very far from this. Further, tooth-nosed snout weevils twist birch leaves into tubes, not just somehow, but according to all the rules of higher mathematics. Studies of the curves of the cuts that the beetle makes on the leaf have shown that it's only through such cuts and not other cuts that it's possible to fold the leaf in such a way. It is very curious that the work of the beetle provides a solution to one of the problems of higher mathematics to construct an evolute according to a given involute. It turns out that if a given mathematical problem is solved correctly, then the leaf really will not unfold. The beetle of course achieves this without complicated calculations. Instinct tells him the only correct and most economical cut shape, which minimizes the labor expended on rolling the leaf. Therefore, the folded leaves do not unfold. Thus, he makes himself a house. Any CNC machine operator will envy his ability. One more example, paper wasps, when they build their nest, reproduce the technology of paper production by man one to one. So, I would just like to tell you so that you understand what nature is. Nature contains all those mechanisms that you and I could not even fathom. And the humanity of the future is the 21st century when we finally think about ourselves. Think about who man is, what nature is. Now we invent man-made things, which are a pitiful likeness of something that's long been invented by God. We need to learn how to recognize and use this. And I wanted to emphasize that this is what you are dealing with and why, from you, there is a special demand. One that is different to that of the students of technical universities. That is why, at the entrance to our university, you saw a sign 
that smoking in front of the university facade is considered as a direct advertisement of tobacco. And we certainly expel anyone who dares to smoke against the background of the university. Well, on to the next slide. I also wanted to show you, so that you already through one picture, may understand one idea. They speak about things like yearning for a homeland, a love for the homeland. In fact, it turns out that all this exists in nature and nothing new has been invented. So, for example, pigeons. If you were to take a pigeon, put it in your car and drive 300 miles before letting it go, it would return to its home. In nature, there is an intrinsic love for the place where you were born. No wonder that in Russian language there is such a proverb. Be of use and carry your business on in the country where you were born. Although many people lose this quality over time. Or here's a scene with bees. This is a scene, I myself watched it on television, it was presented on a nature channel. So, in the southern regions, there is nectar, a drop of nectar in different places including on tree trunks. And if the nectar has already fermented from the sun and therefore contains alcohol, then the bee will not touch this nectar. Bees know that alcohol is the worst thing possible for the health of genetics and for the health of the family. This touches on everyone, both humans and bees. And if one of the bees for some reason has lost these skills of distinguishing between fermented nectar and normal nectar, and tries to bring alcohol-containing nectar into the hive, then the guard detachment of bees, which always stands at the entrance to the hive, rectifies this. It is somewhat similar to the traffic police officers who check drivers for alcohol in their blood with a tube. Thus do the bees, and without the help of tubes, determine everything. And as soon as they sense that this bee is carrying alcohol-containing nectar, the first thing the guard bees do is to mark this bee as an intruder and push it away from the entrance. If it makes a second attempt to carry this alcohol-containing nectar into the hive, then its legs are chewed off. Here this scene shows the guard detachment of a beehive as it gnaws off the legs of a bee which was trying to bring alcohol-containing nectar into the hive. This is how you should understand these processes, not the way you are shown on TV, where we are not shown movies but booze-ups, and that these booze-ups are allegedly the norm. In fact, this isn't a norm, it's an absolute anomaly. And you must ask yourselves the question, why is it that your rector, myself, my daughters, my son, my relatives, people close to me, never in the course of life will I or they take a sip of alcohol. Now if my son during his life takes even one sip of champagne or a sip of beer, then I will have to gather you again and apologize to you that I was wrong. But I have a deep confidence that this will never happen. At the same time, I do not forbid my children from anything. I have simply told them how the world works, how people are deceived, how they are made money on, and what needs to be done in order to realize oneself as a true human. The next slide also contains some only basic things, because I can't tell you this basic material completely from A to Z in two lectures, after listening to which you will understand and know everything. Of course, no. I simply wish to tell you that there exist different people. You can meet these people two or three times in your life, and that's all. Although during your life, such people will become more and more. This information today, including with the help of the internet, is spreading across the globe. So I'll just give you some basic outlines, according to which you may then see in more detail what will interest you to a greater extent. This is all detailed. You can find any information on the internet. Today there are dozens of books on this topic there. In particular, they are labeled as the internal predictor of subordinately sociologically previous Russia. They are also under my name. There is popular information in books, videos and commercials. Here is one of these ideas that I want to remain in your memory. This is the law of time. Just remember this phrase 
And if you say that you know what the law of time is, then many people will look at you in surprise. How do you know what the law of time is? Pushkin spoke about it this way. There is a global system of governance over mankind which is currently operating. And so, about this, he said the following. From the sky, the stars he'll pluck our wager, or shift the moon that sails on high, but change the law of time and aging. He cannot, hard as he may try. So, what is Pushkin talking about? In the entire history of our civilization, and our civilization is not the first, there were civilizations before us, but they exterminated, destroyed themselves. And we also run the risk of self-destruction if we don't think seriously. So, in the entire history of the existence of our civilization, for the first time in my own generation, an event occurred, connected, as we say, with a change in the logic of social behavior. There are two processes going on in the public consciousness. The curve above reflects the change in social consciousness at the genetic level. That is, information is transmitted from generation to generation with an average frequency of about 25 years, from the birth of a mother to the birth of a child, on average 25 years pass. And now, every 25 years, the information is updated. It pumps from one generation into another. But in addition to this process, information is being updated at the extragenetic level. What is the extragenetic level? The extragenetic level is the dominant technology on Earth. That is, imagine the times when the only technology was a stone axe and nothing else. This accordingly influenced the human brain, but the state of development of human consciousness and the brain was nevertheless at a primitive level that is, adequate to this instrument of production. When steam engines appeared, do you think the social consciousness changed? Yes, of course, it changed. And when computers appeared, did the social consciousness change? Yes, of course, it did. So, around 1950, there was an alignment of the frequencies of biological and social time. When the frequency of updating technologies equaled the frequency of updating generations. And now, in our time, the Japanese say that every five to ten years, there is a change in technology. This radically changes everything that happens in the world. Until this moment, the globe was ruled according to the principles of crowd elitism. There was an elite who understood something, and there was a crowd that was kept from understanding this something, because it needed to be manipulated, it needed to be governed. And this pyramid we see here is now collapsing because below there are people who understand what is happening much more deeply than those above. And today, if the students I work with are put in front of, say, the chairman of the central bank or the minister of finance, then this will be an anecdote. That is, the measure of understanding of our guys is simply an order of magnitude higher. I don't mean that the chairman of the central bank or the minister of finance does not understand anything at all and are not good for anything. They understand something, but on matters on which they are allowed to speak, they say absolutely absurd things, because real governance in the economy goes through the loan interest or through money, but no one talks about it. There are all sorts of theories where people say that there is no way to lower the loan interest because we have high inflation. But this inflation is precisely formed by the loan interest. That is, the opposite is true. It's so simple that students pick this up very quickly. And today, I'm sure that many students of our university, in such a discussion with the most prominent employees there of the central bank or the Ministry of Finance, would simply and easily expose their absolute falsity and their misunderstanding generally of the concept of money. Because money should not be the master. Money is just a tool. Money is just information on paper or electronic media and nothing more. The main thing is the goods. That is, if you have electricity, there is a forest, 
there are technologies, there are workers, there is a demand. Then you have to print money and build yourself, for example, housing, because money is just information. Now, if you have nothing, then there is no reason to print money. This would be wrong. And now money is considered the most important thing. Here I will give you an example. Kosma Prutkov spoke about this once, figuratively, in images. You know, Kosma Prutkov was actually a collective character. Alexei Tolstoy in particular stood behind him, as well as some other writers. So, what is money? How does the world work? The world is primarily material resources, and money is their reflection. That is, if you have everything, then you can print money. In this sense, goods are the equivalent to the sun, which provides our life, but money is the moon. It is the reflectiveness of the moon. So, Kosma Prutkov asks, Tell me, what is more important for a person, the sun or the moon? And so, answering this in the current logic of our financial block, well, of course, the moon, because the sun shines during the day when it's already light, and the moon shines at night. This is precisely the measure of understanding of what is happening among our financiers today. The main thing is money. They say, we have to do this, we need to do that. But we, they say, have no money. Print money, they say. What does money have to do with it? Money is just an information environment that accompanies commodity exchange. It is sometimes said that money is the blood of the economy. Complete nonsense. Money is not the blood of the economy. The blood of the economy is goods. This is electricity, the mass of commodities. This is grain. This is food. And money, if we compare and draw analogies, it is nothing more than a channel for promoting goods, since they provide trade. Money is a kind of vessel, but by no means the blood of the economy. Later we will touch on economy briefly, but I said all this so that you understand that new processes are taking place on our planet today, that this pyramid is collapsing. And, as in the Bible, you know, the last will be first. Those who were at the bottom, they may be at the top. And therein lies the question. And those who have considered themselves an all-understanding elite, their failure today is obvious. About 20 years ago, I wrote a book called The Economic Alphabet. There on the cover it was written, for students and school children, for workers and housewives, for the Minister of Economy and Finance. That is, now such information is permeating, which both students and finance ministers can understand equally. But due to the fact that they live in another logic, they have not yet understood that there has been a change in the logic of social behavior, and to continue to live this way into the future will not be possible. So you must look to the future, and you must know that in accordance with the law of time, a change in logic has occurred and must understand that now it is not necessary to expect that you will learn something at university and that's all. This allegedly will be enough for you for all your life. It used to be that way. In the past a person received knowledge and it was sufficient for a hundred years because nothing changed. You see, there is a lower wave. This is, say, a stone axe for millennia, a steam engine for centuries. Here I received knowledge at the beginning of life, and it served me for the rest of life. And now I received knowledge, and after five to ten years, everything has changed. That is, you have to learn to read information. Learning to learn. This is your main task. And this is the essence of the law of time and the change in the logic of social behavior. You should know that the process of perceiving information is twofold since a person has two blocks. I'll show you on the next slide. So, there is a block of consciousness and there is a block of the unconscious levels of the psyche. Conditionally, in computer terminology, hard drive and RAM. So, a person is one who lives primarily relying on the capabilities of the unconscious levels of the psyche, because their speed, memory volumes, are billions of times higher and all the decisions you make 
are actually coming to you from the unconscious. Sleep is one of the most crucial moments in your life. Always take care of sleep, especially early evening sleep. For four hours, you need to try to sleep mostly like the sun. That is, the most valuable sleep is from 10, 11 o'clock to 2 a.m. Everything else is not of as much importance. That is, you need to sleep with the sun and information will flow through your dreams. Through dreams, you will anchor something, consolidate it in your consciousness. If you repeated something like this before going to bed, thought it over before the exam, then when you fall asleep, information from the block of consciousness is pumped into the unconscious and then it will become a property of you as a person. Because, in reality, cognition of the world also somehow proceeds through sleep. That is, it is in a dream that the main cycle of assimilation of information occurs. I often mention to you the term God. On the next slide, I will read you another quote from the Bible. If you talk to the priests, they will tell you that God created man in his own image and likeness. This is not true. You should know this because you are studying at an agrarian university. Here is the excerpt from the Bible. And this was not done by God, only spoken by him. And God said, Let us create man in our image and in our likeness. And further is the following text. And God created man in his own image, in the image of God. There is no likeness here anymore. This is a very important point which I in fact am talking about. Likeness can be obtained only in the process of life. Likeness is not granted from God. Imagine such a cruel thought experiment. Little children, by the will of circumstances, ended up on a desert island where only monkeys live. Here the monkeys warmed them up, fed them, and what do you think? If after 15 years you find yourself on this island, who will you see there? You will see monkeys. Because the formation of a person takes place, as I told you, within a certain matrix. These kids are hanging in the monkey matrix. They absorbed it, and after 13 years of this, you won't be able to teach this person anything. You may only teach in the same way as trainers train monkeys, but nothing more because all programs of becoming human stop and die off at the age of about 13-14 years. As the Russian proverb goes, if little Ivan didn't learn, big Ivan will never learn. I'll give you an example. In a chick, there is an inlaid program of following the mother chicken. But this program only lives for a day or two, nothing more. And if a chick appears, and for two days no one runs past it, then this genetic program will die out, and it will never, like the rest of the chicks, run after its mother. And the same happens in children. If, for example, you don't show your face to your future children, then their memory for faces will not be trained. And then this program will die off, and they don't acquire memory for faces. And the child at a young age can memorize up to 50 faces, and even if he does not know how to speak, nonetheless he will give each person his own nickname and he will immediately recognize them by face. The facial recognition program is being formed, so you must understand that to successfully mature to the level of human with a capital H means to obtain a likeness of the divine. It is possible to obtain a likeness of the divine only in the process of life. Next slide, please. Now, when I say God, I want you to understand that this is only the word God. And what is behind this word? Because you have to be very clear about the difference between a word and a concept. Here I am telling you about the word current. But this is only a word. What are we talking about? The point is that when I pronounce the word current, then someone may have the image of a flowing river, someone else imagines events taking place at this moment, another has the image of a black currant bun. That is, a concept is formed only when the word is combined with an image. Now, if I say mine, and we all have in our thoughts, for example, a gold mine, then we are in agreement on the concepts, and now we can actually talk. This is what you must remember for the rest of your life. 
If you are communicating with another and there is no agreement on the level of concepts, you will utter the same words, swear at each other, without understanding that you are talking about completely different things. One speaks about one thing, the other speaks about another. Of course, the example with the word current is somewhat primitive, but in life this is exactly what happens. This is how we announce some words. For example, the words tolerance, democracy, but what is behind these words? And everyone has it differently. Obama has one thing behind the word democracy. Our president has something else behind the word democracy. Well, who is more democratic? In fact, in our understanding, everything is obvious here. And for some reason, it is not obvious to Obama, because under the word democracy, he is trying to slip completely different images. For example, what is happening in Iraq, in Syria today, for him, this is also democracy, but for us, this is not democracy. Therefore, God is only a word, and you and I can never discuss this topic together if we don't agree on the images that stand behind this word. I'll just tell you that if you want to talk to me on this topic, that I am open for questions at the end, we will make a list and whoever is interested can ask me after the lecture. During the lecture, I touch on each topic as a thesis. But for each phrase here, for each thesis, you can talk separately for two hours. Two hours on Pushkin, two hours on theological issues. You can even organize separate meetings on these and many other issues. But so far, I only give outlines. So I'll tell you about my image, about my concept of God. And then, if these concepts suit you, you will understand at least my ideas, and then you can argue, you can discuss you can find different points of view. But if by concepts we do not agree, then there is simply nothing to talk about. In my understanding, I am a physicist by education. I defended my first dissertation as a physicist. It was only after this that I became a doctor of economics. So I look at questions of God from the standpoint of a physicist. This is absolutely clear to me. I'm a person who deeply and sincerely believes God. And I kind of understand this all in my own way and communicate with Him. I understand how to behave so as not to attract God's wrath onto myself. And I see this phenomenon as follows. The intellect in the universe is structured. And on the slide, I have discrete levels of intellect displayed. Here is the lowest level, relatively speaking. A stone, mineral life, the level of intellect is zero. The stone does not understand anything at all. I will tell you further what I mean by intellect. Now, the next level is already another, completely different level. This is plant life. Plants, in my current interpretation, have intellect as the ability to perceive some information from the outside world and somehow react to it. That is, if you put a flower on the windowsill, then be sure that without your help, the flower itself will figure out where the sun is and turn its leaves in that direction. If it is dry, it will run its roots deeper. If it's damp, it will pull them up. And now, if you mentally imagine that suddenly we have learned to somehow speak the language of plants, if we approached the flower and asked, tell me, what is the universe? The plant wouldn't have a single question. To him, everything is absolutely clear. He will say, everything is very simple. The universe is the sun. This is air. This is soil. This is water. This is organic matter. This is the mineral world. These are my leaves. This is the synthesis which I create. That is, it absolutely understands everything because it has such a way of forming a world view. It has its own process. The next level is the animal world. So, imagine that from the upper animal level, a goat approaches this plant, eats a leaf from it. For a plant, this is an intervention from above. That is, an intervention occurred from a higher level of organization of the intellect. And the universe is arranged in such a way that from a lower level, 
a higher level is in principle not cognizable. That is, in the stereotypes of the perception of the world, it is impossible for plants to form any idea of what a goat is. It simply doesn't have such organs of perception of the world to understand what a goat is. The next level in this ladder is a person. And besides what I told you, there is also a very important circumstance for you to understand the idea of God. Man is not the summit and the crown of the universe in this ladder of intellect. For me as a physicist, this is obvious, because of course we perceive the world and form some kind of world view, but consider how we form it. Take the scale of the electromagnetic waves, an endless school with a wide variety of ranges, starting from radio waves, then we have light waves, then microwaves, then X-ray waves, and so on. What is the difference? The only difference is in the wavelength, and that's it. So, from this whole spectrum, we perceive something like one millionth of a part, and that is all. But we get the impression that we see everything. In fact, we are very limited and see very little. We see one millionth of what the world is generally filled with and what is happening in it. And everything else remains invisible to us because you and I, for example, do not record existing incorporeal essences and you and I are, by nature, generally incorporeal essences. When I say I, then what is in front of you is not me. I never identify myself with this bodily shell. This is just a body. Man is body, spirit and soul. I am a soul and this body has been given to me for a while. I can be in a body, I can leave it. But the body is not the only evidence of human existence and the term I. So a person in this sense is not able to perceive the universe in all its holisticness and in all its diversity. Well, what is infinity? Maybe I'm just stupid. You explain it to me. What is infinity? So you fly directly in a straight line for a million years, then a million light years, then further. And then what? Is it a fence or ditches? Well, what is it like, this infinity? That is, our mind in general somehow does not reflect our world very well. Therefore, people who are deep enough cannot cope with such concepts such as Kant, for example. He said, Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe, the oftener and more steadily we reflect on them. The starry heavens above and the moral, meaning nravius, law within. The starry heavens above his head were completely incomprehensible to him. And in the same way, nravius laws are what our lecture is devoted to. This is also given to us by God. If Obama had not re-magnetized what was given to him by God, he would also have understood democracy differently, in a divine way, and not in the way he understands it today. That is why this Nravius law and this infinity speak to the fact that we perceive, of course, the world, but the algorithm is about the same as that of a plant. It also seems to the plant that he understands absolutely everything, and in the same way, it seems to us that we understand absolutely everything. But this is not so. As a physicist, I understand this. And I've traveled to almost all countries of the world, from Indonesia, India, to Venezuela and the USA, Canada. And there is no country in the world who does not carry the idea of God. As a physicist, I understand that there is genuinely something behind this idea. It cannot be that for thousands of years all peoples carried an idea of God and nothing would stand behind it. So, what's behind this? I'm trying to figure it out and tell you how to figure it out. So, in my understanding, as above a plant, there is something that it does not understand, so above a person, there is a higher level of organization of the intellect but I call it the highest reason, the highest mind. You can say God, because, I say again, a word is just a code and nothing more, as in the case with the word current. So, God, the highest mind, 
is that phenomenon that really exists in nature, which is above us and which is uncognizable by us, just as a goat is uncognizable from the level of a plant. This is what God is in my understanding. And yet why is all this necessary? This idea is necessary in order to find a happy destiny. The next slide briefly depicts this in just a few words. The path of His providence is unknown, for there is faith in Him, but to Him faith is none. That is, the most important mechanism for interacting with God is this. You must believe Him. You must know that if you live in a divine way, then God will protect you from any of the worst accidents. I have hundreds of such examples that happened with me, with my loved ones, through such accidents. I'll give you one example. Three people, my acquaintances, had to go from Moscow to St. Petersburg. They had already booked tickets for a train that ended up crashing. Remember this crash? So none of them got on this train, by accident. In other words, if you live in a divine way and believe God, that God exercises guidance over you, then you will never get on that plane, which is in some way not destined to fly safely. You will never get on that bus that later flips over. You will either be late, or you will lose your ticket, or you will forget your passport at home, but something accidentally will happen. This is a factually operating mechanism. It's so obvious, it's just that no one looks for it, no one listens for it. I began to pay attention to this mechanism sometime around 25 years ago when I was told about it. From that moment, I stopped consuming alcohol. As for smoking, I have never smoked, and I treated alcohol like everyone else. So, this is absolutely wrong. Like everyone else. This is called a zombie biorobot. You need to have your own head on your shoulders. So, after that, I began to observe these accidents. The example of my acquaintances not getting on the later to crash train, you already know. But I have dozens of such examples. They are absolutely inexplicable, except that these are signs from above. These signs from above, I had already begun to feel them on myself, and then suddenly I came across a passage by Anatoly France. Chance is perhaps a pseudonym for God when he did not want to sign. By chance, something happened to you. You walked, stumbled, broke your nose. That is worth taking and thinking about. Because God is telling you that last week or three days ago, you did something not in a divine way. And if you are honest with yourself, because sometimes people lie even to themselves, then you will recall this undivine thing. God, I won't do this anymore, and then there won't be any more bad accidents with you. If your reaction is something like, okay, whatever, then it will become worse yet. Pushkin once spoke thus. Providence is not algebra. The human mind, as the folk expression goes, is not a prophet, but a conjecturer. It sees the general course of things and can deduce from it profound suppositions, often justified by time. But it cannot foresee chance, that powerful and instantaneous instrument of providence. As for demons, who abuse life and those around them in the name of their own self-interest, and everything is good, good, good with them, until one day, an accident happens and they die. Unfortunately, I also had acquaintances to whom I spoke about this, and they dismissed it, saying, Stop talking nonsense, you have to make money. They made and made money, then one of my acquaintances walked into a porch. A bomb exploded overhead. And now, in the Alexander Nevsky Lavra, you can see a life-size monument next to Subchak, cast in bronze. This is exactly what Pushkin wrote about such people. But they cannot foresee chance, that powerful and instantaneous instrument of providence. If you want to find a happy destiny, escape unfortunate accidents, change yourself. As the Quran says, God does not change the condition of a nation unless it changes what is in its heart. On the next slide, I want to briefly show you something. I say that in order that God should guide you, 
save you from all kinds of accidents, you need to live in a divine way. And what does it mean to live in a divine way? Well, this of course is a four-hour lecture in itself. But if we put it into thesis form, then in just 30 seconds, I will tell you so that you understand. To live in a divine way, the first thing to do is not harm yourself. That is, if you smoke, consume alcohol, forget about God's guidance for three years. God's guidance begins about three years after the last sip of alcohol. Do not harm yourself, do not harm the people around you, do not harm creation. That is, let's say you mess something up somewhere in the clearing of some forest, and the next day a man comes across your mess. You never knew him, you don't know, and you won't ever see him. But when he is faced with all this, he becomes indignant. Because, for example, he brought his children along with him and this is going on. This means not to cause harm in creation. In fact, everything is so very simple. Now, on the next slide, I want to emphasize to you once again that the most important thing is to gain this worldview security so that God begins to guide over you. Because it was Martin Luther King who said, We have learned to fly the air like birds and swim the sea like fish, but we have not learned the simple art of living together as brothers. We aren't able to do this 100%. And the further humanity develops, the worse it becomes, and the further it moves away from the ability to live like a human being. And now, in general, everything is imbued only with the purpose of dehumanizing humanity, so that no one in any cases matures to the level of human. And on the next slide, I'll tell you that this is another separate lecture in itself on the psyche, types of structure of the psyche. There are four types of psyche structure. You won't find this in any textbook on psychology. This is our own view of what is happening and it proceeds from life, not from theory. A child who is born is guaranteed to pass through these stages. The first stage, the first type of structure of the psyche, is the animal type. What is this? This is when the basic instincts unfold, to eat, to sleep, later the sexual instinct. Now, if instincts govern a person's life when he is already an adult, he makes all decisions primarily under the guidance of animal instincts. This is an animal type of psyche structure. The second type of psyche structure is the zombie bio-robot, when a person acts in a certain way because everyone else does so. This is the typical behavior of a zombie bio-robot. So he was told, so he sees how it happens, and so he does exactly the same. This is a very common type of psyche structure. The third type of structure of the psyche is the demonic type. Demons believe that there is no God, that these zombie bio-robots are understandable and predictable, and I, they say, am not like that. I will steer them. I will govern over and manipulate them. They drink, but I don't. I'll just take a glass for show and shepherd them. Thus, demons graze zombie bio-robots, and zombie bio-robots herd people with an animal type of psyche. There are no people with one of these psyche types in their pure form, but each of us is dominated by either one or the other. And in the morning, one can dominate, and by evening, another can dominate. That is, these types of structure of the psyche, they are manifested in one way or another in the life of every person, but to a greater or lesser extent. So I am giving this lecture to you so that you orient yourself towards becoming a person with a fourth type of psyche structure, a reasoning person, a human. It is this human for whom the famous ancient Greek philosopher was searching in the city of Sinope, holding in his hand a lit lantern. And when he was asked, what are you doing? He replied that he was looking for a man. But Diogenes was a very intelligent person. He understood what he was doing. Now, if Diogenes walked along the Nevsky Prospect with a lantern, then I think that he would also have to walk for more than one day before he would find a human, a reasonable person, because today we are making very little progress in this direction. On the next slide, 
I simply wanted to warn you against choosing yourself a path of darkness. A person, when he considers his mission in general, in fact becomes a hostage of instincts and an object of parasitism from the outside on his vices. The goal of pleasure. It is the most unhappy of people who live for pleasure. Here you need to have willpower and you need to live in a divine way and in no case in the name of pleasure. A life in the name of pleasure is such a ragged life from pleasure to pleasure. Two minutes of pleasure and then two days of repentance and discomfort. That is why the main thing is not to fall for this trap of transnational corporations. The main task of this path, which is prepared for you by television, the media, cinema and so on, is the corruption of the psyche. Then there are tobacco, alcohol, drugs, then, naturally, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics as a genetic weapon, then there is vicious medicine, which means making money on you and for distributing pills, then pseudo-fashion, show business, high-performance sports, and then for funeral services. But as a rule, funeral services do not come into play for a long time. First a clinic in Switzerland, then a clinic in Germany. That is, as long as you still have money, the system will never let you go. So we would very much like the students of our university to not fall for this bait. On the next slide, I have prepared such a picture for you, so that you will remember it. Maybe later you will find an application for these pictures for life. Here we have the basic technology of wiring a person. There is a certain truth, and there is a certain lie in creation in general. But in order for a person not to come to the truth, the lie is always split into two lies. Lie number one and lie number two. They present you with these and say, are you for this or are you for that? But you should have your own head and say, no, neither this nor that suits me. I look at the world completely differently. And you will be forced to make a false choice between socialism and capitalism, for example. Which is better? None are better. Better rational organization of life. No isms are needed. And we have only these endless disputes between all sorts of uncontested losing alternatives. Only a market economy or only a planned economy, only socialism or only capitalism. But the truth is that there is one God for all living on earth, the Creator and Almighty, at all literal levels and for all people, for whites and for Russians and for the Chinese and for Germans and for Italians, because God is God. This is an objective phenomenon, and this is what the truth consists in, that there is one God for all living on earth. But if you look at the theological analysis in the current situation, it turns out that few people talk about this truth. Now to the next picture. In this picture, usually when I read a course for masters, in this picture we have somewhere in the region of four hours allotted, so that you know that this material has been developed in detail scheduled in order for you to know that there are priorities of governance over society. In reality, society is not governed the way it is commonly thought, in the way where the president and the government decide everything, nothing of the kind. Neither the president nor the government have a direct relationship to the formation of the future statehood. The governance of social systems is carried out on the basis of the six priorities of governance over society, and these priorities hang over presidents, over governments. These are the supranational levels of governance. This is the so-called conceptual power, these six priorities. The weakest at the bottom, the most powerful at the top, the fastest at the bottom, and the slowest at the top. That is, performance and power are inversely proportional. Thus, military weapons are a very quick means, but the desired quality does not shine. So we won the Second World War and then went on to bow before the vanquished for credit. That is, military weapons are a very weak tool. Genetic weapons are precisely alcohol, tobacco, drugs. 
these shoot not only at the living, but also the children and grandchildren. If you have introduced alcohol into a society as a norm, then this society is guaranteed to be destroyed in 20, 30, 40 years if it perceives it as a norm. Rus had always been sober, Rus had never consumed alcohol, and only from the moment of the baptism did they begin to impose alcohol on us. But Rus was always at the core sober, and this sobriety is maintained in the culture of the people to this day. The fourth priority, I already told you, this is a tool of governance, nothing else. The third priority in terms of power, please note, one of the most important, is ideology. This is television, this is the mass media. The second priority is history, chronology. You see, the history that you write, this is the future you will get. That is, the future is determined by how the history is set out. Therefore, history was never a science. History has always been an instrument of global governance. Now, if Stalin is a tyrant and nothing else, then you will have one future. If you understand that Stalinist houses were built under Stalin, the world's best cars at the time, the ZIL ZIS-21, Volga, Pabieda were produced. If you know that under Stalin, prices for all consumer products were reduced annually, and Stalin thought about the interests of the majority. That is why he was so hated by the elite, but the people respect Stalin. And when they started throwing dirt on Stalin's name, Kamaz trucks drove around our country with portraits of Stalin in glass. So, history is a tool of governance. Worldview is the basic first priority. So, it is necessary that you understand that there are six basic priorities. Pushkin, by the way, talks about this, that there exists conceptual power outside of what we know. A small momentary digression. Once in Crimea, Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill had a meeting. Roosevelt and Churchill, noticing that Stalin is in a good mood, say to him, Joseph Vissarionovich, you could cede Crimea to us and we would move the borders in Europe there. Stalin says, fine, I'll give you Crimea if one of you guesses which one of these three fingers is the middle one. Stalin had very serious conceptual knowledge. Conceptual power is the thumb. The index finger is ideological power. So Stalin asks, which of these three fingers is the middle one? Well, Churchill decides on the middle one. Roosevelt is more cunning. He points to the index finger. Stalin says, no, you didn't guess. This is the middle one. So, Crimea remained ours during the time of Stalin and became ours again thanks to Vladimir Putin, who in many ways is also conceptually literate. I cannot talk about this, but there is direct evidence that Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin is not just a governor, but also a conceptually wealthy governor. Pushkin wrote about such governors who were conceptually wealthy. He wrote this about conceptual power. I don't rate very highly any loud mouth rights, the ones that oftentimes besot so many minds. I am not sorry that the gods should have divested me of sweet destiny to question fees and taxes or hinder tsars that be in their intent to fight. Nor am I bothered if the press has any right to fool a blockhead or a picky censor ever restricts a windbag in a magazine endeavor. You see, all this is none but words, words, words. This poem is called From Pindemonti. Pindemonti was an Italian poet. And if you read this poem deeply, then it will very seriously help you in life. But again, if speaking about Pushkin, I'll simply briefly quote to you his words on military weapons, that is, about the sixth priority. You whose swords clash in contest gory, persist in your dread rivalry, pay tribute full to sombre glory, and relish hate and enmity. Let the world gaping at your deadly encounters freeze no none will try, to interfere more none will sadly, of pity for you breathe a sigh. If two countries go to war, 
then there is always a third party who has organized it and who reaps the benefits. Pushkin also spoke about the fifth priority, and economics he knew well, which is to say that he could tell the ways in which the state progresses, the actual things that make it thrive, and why for gold it need not strive, when basic products it possesses. We don't have such economists in the country today. You can safely use the word dollar instead of gold, since today the dollar has taken over the function of gold. If earlier gold insured the currencies of different countries, today this function lies with the dollar. So Pushkin warned us that we do not need a dollar, we need to sell our own resources for rubles, as Vladimir Putin has spoken about in his time. But the financial bloc is impeding all of this. I will tell you briefly about another of the priorities. These are genetic weapons, priority 5. Please, next slide. So let us break this down. At the bottom we have the sixth priority, pistols, rifles, cannons and so on. Does a cannon differ from a pistol? It differs, but not in its purpose. By design, it's actually the same thing. It's only the destructive power that is different. Now we take genetic weapons, champagne, wine, vodka, heroin. Is champagne different from heroin? For me, for example, not at all. Champagne is much more dangerous because not many people get hooked on heroin, but champagne is easy. Through champagne, alcohol is dragged away from distinction as a genetic weapon against people, against women, children. Give them a little champagne. It seems to be harmless, but the process has already gone further. What is important is that a person loses the distinction of this as a genetic weapon. Therefore, the most dangerous people socially are people who drink in a culturally moderate way. I would erect a monument to alcoholics like Alexander Matrosov because they demonstrate to you, the younger generation, what alcohol really is. Children can look and say, no, I will never drink. And then they see another uncle who sips a glass of champagne on New Year, a glass of cognac on his birthday, and they think that they will be like this uncle. One glass, they say, that's all. But the composition of alcohol is such that if a person drinks a glass, then the next time he will need one and a half. And this, with very rare exceptions, is physiologically what happens. This is physiology, there is no other way. And only those who have a powerful will and some physiological characteristics can slow down somewhere along the line. However, most of those who started with a glass of cognac and a glass of champagne become alcoholics in 20 years, although they don't consider themselves as such. I only drink twice a week, they say. But think, if a person drinks twice a week, from where can he get God's guidance? From where did all of life come? That is why it is very important to understand all of this. Now for the next slide, I wanted to tell you about the physiology of intoxication. Besides, I also wanted to test a little. Tell me, everyone, this is simply very important for me. I speak in different audiences. Do any of you know what happens in a person's brain when a person has drunk alcohol, has a noise in his head and so on? Raise your hands, please, those who know what happens if a person drinks alcohol. So about the physiology of intoxication. In the 60s, three scientists from the USA discovered such a phenomenon which they named the grape bunch effect. They observed what happened in the human brain through the pupil. The pupil is a piece of the brain. A special microscope made it possible to see through the walls of the vessel what was happening there. Erythrocytes, that is, red blood cells that have a so-called lipid layer, a fatty lubricant. When an erythrocyte flows along the walls of a vessel, it becomes electrified and acquires a small negative charge. Therefore, in a normal state of a person, erythrocytes repel each other and all flow one by one. In our brain, the diameter of the capillaries is commensurate and even smaller than the size of an erythrocyte. The erythrocyte approaching such a thin capillary 
changes its geometric shape and passes through. The erythrocyte delivers the oxygen it received in the lungs, absorbs carbon dioxide, and after that we exhale. Life is oxygen exchange. When alcohol enters the bloodstream, the erythrocytes are defatted with alcohol. Alcohol removes the fat from any surface, and the red blood cells begin to possess new properties. They stick to each other, and the blood begins to flow so that the erythrocytes do not flow one by one, but in the shape of a bunch of grapes. And when this bunch falls into a thin vessel, then this bunch gets stuck where a single erythrocyte would be able to pass. A blood clot forms in the vessel, and the blood does not flow further. And since the blood does not flow, then after three minutes, the death of this micro area of the brain begins. That is, the neurons, the cells with which we think, begin to simply physiologically die. They die from oxygen starvation. If you would like to understand and test what it's like for neurons, then dunk your head under water and see how long you remain there. This is the same experience you organize for the individual parts of your brain if you have drunk alcohol. And therefore any consumption of alcohol is self-harm. About 10 million neurons die from 100 grams of vodka. We actually have about 60 billion neurons, but intellect is the connections between the neurons. Each neuron has up to a thousand synapses, that is, connections. One neuron gets taken out, and it was connected to thousands of others, and something changes a little in the brain and in intellectual activity. And in order to understand in which direction it is changing, go to a beer stall and look into the eyes of a person who stands there from morning till evening. His eyes are much dimmer than a dog's. Look into such eyes, you must have seen them. Our students even observe this with pathologists. When the skull of a deceased alcoholic is opened, his brain is covered with a hole, as if a moth had devoured it, because after the death of neurons, dead tissue forms in the brain. A person begins to consume an excess amount of fluid, as this brain is washed with a syringe, and the dead tissue is torn off from the living one and is excreted in the urine. Here, the Russian language is very precise about this physiological phenomenon. This is expressed in the phrase, I pissed out all my brains, to put it mildly. This is not figurative, and the expression is precisely the true reflection of the ongoing physiological processes, that is, if you want to mock your brains, then the only remedy is alcohol. In addition to the fact that moderate drinkers are zombified for alcohol consumption, you should also know that beer is the most dangerous of all alcoholic beverages, because beer contains phytoestrogens. Phytoestrogen is a substance that is formed when hops and malt combine. There are estrogens in the female body, this is the female sex hormone. But phytoestrogen is a natural estrogen. If a woman drinks beer, her female hormone production mechanism is blocked, and she becomes masculine. She will be angular, she will have a male voice. And if a man drinks beer, then on the contrary, female hormones will prevail. He will have rounded shapes, fullness, and unfortunately, very few people know, they form a colostrum, that is, they activate the function of milk reproduction. I mean, who wants to mutilate himself, for God's sake? And not a single beer company today belongs to Russia. These are all Western companies. So if you want to save yourself, and you want to have strong ancestral genetics, don't drink beer. This is what the students of the Agrarian University should know. You need to know what phytoestrogen is. Next slide, please. These are actual photographs, the lungs of a person, a smoker and a non-smoker. What is smoking? This is ammonia, carbon monoxide, carcinogenic hydrocarbons. This is what ensures the occurrence of malignant tumors. With the smoke of a cigarette, a person inhales up to 100 toxic components. 
For me, this is such absolute nonsense. I will never understand a person who voluntarily lights a cigarette, inhales hundreds of toxic ingredients, and then pays for it himself. One could at least rise to the level of cockroach. After all, when cockroaches are poisoned with dichlorvis, they don't spend money for this, right? Those who poison themselves buy this dichlorvis. A man, unlike a cockroach, is able to poison himself at his own expense. We are not talking about the fact that our science is bad, it's just that these are basic things. These are basic things that no one will tell you. Because the tobacco industry is the coolest business. And only thanks to information in recent times, the amount of alcohol consumption in our country has decreased by 30%. And not because people began to drink less. Whoever drank before, he still drinks. It's just that young people have appeared, for whom it is fashionable not to drink or smoke in principle. So I give lectures in almost all regions of the country, and in the past I spoke especially often. Now, of course, due to my employment, it is not possible, but it's becoming fashionable among young people not to drink or smoke. Here we have just a couple of minutes I'll borrow from you, and then if you have any questions, we will discuss. The next slide is Leskaft Francevich. There is a very serious university named after Leskaft. So it says, Happy is he who does not know the smell of wine, tobacco, cards, all kinds of corrupting entertainment and sports. This was said by the person after whom the University of Physical Education and Sports is named. He speaks of the harmful effects on the human body of professional sports, sports of high achievements. Sport is physical culture. Yugolev Alexander Mikhailovich, a unique geneticist, in his book, Theory of Unique Nutrition and Trophology, proved that the food that is imposed on us is deliberately imposed because the biggest money is made on food. He proved that in reality, a person can eat differently. We can feed ourselves. That is, what we ate, so we are. Or we cannot feed ourselves at all, but feed only the microflora, of which we have three and a half, four kilograms. If you cultivate and nurture in yourself a useful microflora that does not acidify, does not slag the body, which produces everything that we need. Finally, I would like to say that living in megalopolises, there is a lot of influence of various negative factors. Our task is to live in contact with nature. I have everything then. If you have any general questions, you can ask them. Общие вопросы есть, вы можете их задать.